Hi, I'm Thomas Kesselhan from University of Bonn. Welcome to my talk. I'm excited to present joint work with Paul Ditting and Brent Luce here on an O of log log and profit inequality for sub-additive combinatorial auctions. The setting we are considering is as follows. We'll have n buyers arriving one by one and we have m items. And at each arrival we have to decide which of these items to assign, possibly none, and we either want to maximize social welfare or revenue. So for example, we might have these two items and the first buyer now has a value of 1 for the first item, a value of 2 for the second item, and a value of 3 for both items together. Let's not give him any item. This second lady has a value of 0 for the first item, a value of 10 for the second item, and also a value of 10 for both items together. So let's give her the second item. Now our social welfare is already 10. This third guy, he now has a value of 5 for either the first or the second item or also for both items together. So let's give him the first item and now we have a social welfare of 15. Now this lady shows up and she would have a value of even 60 for both items together, but unfortunately both items are already allocated so we cannot give her anything although we would like to. So now we have only a social welfare of 15. As you realize in a worst case setting you cannot do a lot here and that's why we adopt the standard assumption from algorithmic mechanism design that these valuations are drawn independently from distributions which are known in advance. What is known for this problem? Well a lot is known if all valuation functions are XLS. For example, these might be submodular functions. All submodular functions are XLS. Feldman, Gravin and Luce here gave a two approximation of the optimal welfare and they did this via static anonymous item prices. This is actually a pretty cool result because it shows that the classic profit inequality, uh, which would be the special case of only a single item, generalizes to also multiple items and they even get the constant right. They even get the same constant that you would get for the single item setting with the standard classic profit inequality. For revenue, the problem isn't quite as easy, unsurprisingly, but Tsai and Zhao gave a constant factor approximation to the optimal revenue via a simple mechanism. It's not quite as easy as these static anonymous item prices by Feldman, Graven and Luce here because they also have to use an entry fee for each of the buyers, but it is still not super complicated as a mechanism and easy to explain. These are excellent results, but what we were interested in was what if one goes beyond XOS functions? Namely, our question was what if the valuations are only sub-additive, which means all we assume is that any buyer has the following valuation structure, the value of the union of two sets is no more than the sum of the individual values of the two sets. So far, all that was known were log m approximations, because in both of these cases you can approximate the sub-additive functions by XOS functions and then apply these constant factor approximations. We now show that for both these settings, so for both welfare and revenue, we get an O of log log m approximation for the case that the valuation functions are sub-additive. In the case of welfare, we again only use static anonymous item prices. And in the case of revenue, we also use a simple mechanism, which is actually kind of the same mechanism that Tsai and Zhao were using. We also show that both these mechanisms run in polynomial time given access to demand oracles. How do we achieve these log log m bounds? To give you an idea of how we get there, maybe let's first take a detour why XOS functions are usually much easier to work with than subadditive functions because XOS functions admit something that I want to call balanced prices for this talk. What is this? Well, assume that you want to maximize welfare and there's just one buyer that you have in mind who should buy 
these three items one two and three and you want to now set prices for these items so that loosely speaking nothing can go wrong and these prices shouldn't be too low and they shouldn't be too high this is what would make the prices balanced let's consider a first example of an xos function namely just an additive function the value of the buyer we have in mind could be just the number of items they are getting. Then I claim setting all item prices to one would be good prices. Why that? These prices aren't too high because the buyer could in principle buy all these items. This is the first condition that we have here, that the sum of the prices in the set U are no more than the value of the set U. But these prices aren't too low either. This is this second condition here, because for any set T, the following thing holds. If somebody now came along, so any other buyers, and bought, for example, items two and three, then they would pay one plus one, and this would exactly in this case make up for the value that is lost by the buyer. So more generally the sum of the, uh, of the prices in this set is at least the value for the entire set minus the remaining value. So this difference is the value lost because the other buyers are taking away set t. And this in this case is pretty easy to see holds for any set t. But this also works for more complicated examples of functions. For example, this unit demand function, which is still an XOS function. Here, the value of a set is one, unless it is the empty set. So regardless of whether I get one or two or three items, my value will always be one. How could I set prices here? For example, I could set a price of one for the first item and no price for the other two items. Then again, the sum of the prices isn't too high because the sum of the prices is one plus zero plus zero. So this will be one, which is also the value for this set. On the other hand, what would happen if now other buyers are taking away items? For example, they might take away items two and three. In this case, they wouldn't pay anything, but that doesn't matter because the value of item one is the same as the value for all three items together. They could also take away all items and then they are paying one. Then they would actually make up for the value that is lost. So also these prices aren't too low. This holds generally for any XOS function that you can define prices which are not too high and not too low in this sense. But if you now go beyond XOS functions to more general sub-additive functions, this does not work anymore. And we have here a very easy example of a sub-additive function, which is not XOS. How is this now defined? Well, my value is zero if I'm not getting anything. My value is one if I'm getting one or two of the items. And if I'm getting all three items, then my value will be two. It is not difficult now to verify that this is a sub-additive function. But are there now balanced prices in this sense here? Well, what would have to hold for prices to be balanced? These prices would have to be high enough, which means, for example, for this set T that we see here, the price somebody would have to pay for item two would make up for the value that is lost. How much value is lost if we're taking away item two? Well, our value was two before, now it is only one. So this price has to be at least one. And this holds for all three items by symmetry. But then we see, okay, now these prices are actually too high because they sum up to more than the value of the set. The sum of the prices is at least three, but the value of the set is only two. 
One might now be tempted to say, okay, this isn't too bad here because we're only off by a constant factor. And indeed, this is something that you can do. You can relax both these inequalities by introducing factors here on the respective right-hand sides. And then you will also get an approximate notion of balanced prices for subadditive functions. However, there are more complicated examples than this here where you will actually lose a factor of log m this way. And this is exactly the reason for the log m barrier that we're facing. But our approach is now, well, is it really necessary that these inequalities are fulfilled? And the answer is not quite. And to illustrate this, let's look back at this unit demand function. What do we have there? For example, we could set prices, all item prices to one. These prices wouldn't be balanced in the classical sense because these prices are too high. A buyer could not buy all of these items at these prices because the sum of these prices is three, whereas the value for the set is only one. However, who says that the buyer we have in mind should actually buy all these items? In this case, it is even enough to buy only one of these items, which is the set S here. And this set S would make the buyer already as happy as having all the items. But on this set, the sum of the prices is only one, so the prices are not too high. What's the advantage of this? The advantage is that we now set prices which are much higher than the prices before. As we show in our paper, this is always possible for any subadditive function in a similar way, which means that there is a way of setting prices such that there will be a set of items that the, the intended buyer can still afford, whereas whatever other buyers are taking away from this intended buyer, what they are paying, this makes up for the value that is lost. And exactly this property, that there are always good prices, but in a weaker sense, for any subadditive function, is formalized by our key lemma, which I'll focus on for the remainder of this talk. In our paper, then you'll find details on how to apply the key lemma for both the welfare and the revenue setting by combining it with and extending the techniques of Feldman, Gravin and Lucier for welfare, respectively, Sai and Zhao for revenue. So what does this key lemma tell us? The lemma now tells us that for any subadditive function vi and any set of items u, there exist not only prices, but also a probability distribution lambda such that a certain property holds. What does this property say? Well, you see on the left hand side, we have some interesting sums and on the right hand side, we have the value of the set u divided by gamma, where gamma will be in the order of log log m. What is this on the left hand side? Well, these are our items, more than three this time. And the lemma now says there are prices for all the items and a probability distribution over sets of items. So for example, this probability distribution lambda might be the uniform distribution over these four sets. And now these prices together with the probability distribution have the following property. For any set T, which you should again think of of what other buyers are taking away so for example this set we now have the following property we'll see here the sum of the prices that these other buyers pay and then we add to this the following thing draw a random set from this probability distribution and try to buy it so this will be your value 
of whatever is left from the set S that you draw from the distribution minus the prices that you'll have to pay for the remainder of the set. The sum of these two things will be at least the value of all items combined divided by gamma. In this way of stating things, it is a little more implicit that prices aren't too high and they aren't too low, but you should still think of this the same way. So you will have the sum of these pj that somebody will be paying if they are removing items from us. And then on the other hand, we have the value of what is left minus the prices one would have to pay to buy these items, but importantly, only for a subset of the items which is drawn from the distribution lambda. How do you prove such a lemma? Well, for the time being, let's assume we already know the probability distribution and we just want to figure out whether these prices exist or not. Then we see, okay, all these constraints are actually linear constraints in terms of the prices. So, we might also just write down an LP and if it has a solution, then there exist prices. If it does not have a solution, there are no such prices. How can we show that an LP has a feasible solution? We can consider its dual and show that its solutions are bounded. And this way we get to the following equivalent formulation of this key lemma which is the following. It now says that there exists a probability distribution lambda such that for every probability distribution mu that fulfills certain constraints, some inequality has to hold. Let's try to understand this. Here are again our items. This is again our probability distribution lambda. For example, the uniform distribution over these four sets. This is what our protagonist will be choosing. And now we have an antagonist who also chooses a probability distribution, which we call mu. So for example, the uniform distribution over these five sets. This antagonist is constrained in a certain way, which we'll discuss in a second. Let's first see what this inequality is telling us. It now says, draw from both lambda and t simultaneously, independently, and consider the expected value that you're getting. Namely, the expected value of S take away T. And what now has to hold is that this will be at least a 1 over gamma fraction of the value of all items. In which way is the antagonist now constrained? Well, the protagonist chooses a probability distribution over sets of items and this way we'll have a probability for every item j that it would be contained if we draw a set s from this distribution lambda. And the distribution mu is now constrained in the way that it shouldn't put probability higher on any item than lambda is doing. And this is, for example, fulfilled in my example down below here, because there lambda, if this is the uniform distribution, would put a probability of a quarter on every item, whereas mu, if it is the uniform distribution over these five sets, puts only a probability of a fifth on every of these items. So all we now have to show is that there always exists a probability distribution lambda that fulfills this property. How do we do that? So our claim is now that there always exists a probability distribution lambda such that for all mu this inequality holds. To start, let's do something kind of naive. Let's hope that it is just okay to choose every item with probability a half. What do we do now? We'll take the distribution lambda over sets of items that maximizes the expected value subject to the constraint that we may not put a probability of more than a half on any item. 
One thing that you could, for example, do is take all items with probability a half and no item otherwise. This would give you an expected value of half the value of all items, but there might be some much smarter things to do. So, for example, you might want to split up your items into two sets and take the uniform distribution over these two sets, or maybe something even a lot smarter. Now, what will happen? Now, our antagonist chooses a distribution mu, which is also constrained by putting only a probability of a half on every item. Now, what can happen? We are now, now interested in the expected value of s take away t, where s is a draw from lambda, t is a draw from mu. It can now happen that the expected value of s take away t is already large. Then everything's great. Or it might be that this is small. But then, and this is now the point where we use subadditivity, then the value of the intersection of the sets s and t has to be large. So if our lambda was actually a poor choice, then the expected value of s intersect t will have to be large. But what do we know about this intersection? Well, we know that the probability of any item to be contained in this intersection will be no more than a quarter, because the probability for an item to be contained in the set S is at most a half, and T, um, which is drawn independently from S, uh, the probability will also be a half, so the probability to be in the intersection will be a quarter. What does this now mean? This now means that we might as well, for our lambda, choose the distribution which maximizes the expected value subject to the constraint that it puts no more than a quarter on any item. We now know that the expected value that we're getting this way will be at least the expected value of the intersection that we had for the case of q being a half. So this might now be a totally different lambda that we're choosing, but it puts only a probability of a quarter on every item. Again, our antagonist chooses a mu, and we'll do the same argument over. So now also draw set S, also draw set T, either everything's great or still there is a large value in the intersection, then consider Q squared, which is then 1 over 16. And do the same argument uh, over and over again until at some point the value in the intersection really has to be small. Because once you put a probability of 1 over m on every item. The probability of an item to be in this intersection is only 1 over m squared. And this means that if you now repeatedly apply this argument, one of the cues that you will be coming along will be good, and how many are these? Those are only log log m many choices. You might now ask, can you actually do better here? And the answer is both maybe and no. No, because as we show in our paper, this way of choosing the same probability for every item, there are valuation functions such that for any lambda, which all put the same probability on any item, the gap will be as large as log log m. However, this does not rule out that you actually get something better than log log m by choosing different probabilities for different items. Let me conclude at this point. So as I said multiple times, we have these O of log log m approximations for sub-additive valuations via a new weaker notion of balanced prices. And I'm pretty sure that this same key lemma can also be used for other settings with sub-additive functions. For example, 
in a follow-up paper with Separ Asadi and Sayed Singla, which will appear in Soda, uh, we are showing how to use this key lemma to actually deal with prior free subadditive combinatorial auctions. And this brings me to my first open question, namely, are there further applications? I'm pretty sure that you can just use this key lemma in a way that you were always using the balance prices for XOS functions to now extend results to subadditive functions. And of course, there's the pretty obvious open question whether you can or cannot get this down to a constant. If I had to guess at this point, I would say, yes, a constant is possible, but as I was saying earlier, it will have to use somewhat smarter techniques. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. If you have any questions, feel free to send us an email and let's hope that we can meet in person again sometime soon. In the meantime, stay safe. Bye.